So um, one of the conversations I had with a friend at Porkfest was about uh, the libertarian spark in the U.S. society and in other societies, and whether that spark exists here and whether it, it exists in other places. And since uh, I grew up in Russia, um, um, that friend asked me whether what I thought of the Russian society and um, the um, the predisposition, if we can talk about it, about that in, in in that kind of terms, um, of the Russian society or, or Russians towards libertarianism, how accepting or receptive to libertarianism Russians can be or are, whatever. Okay. Um, I'm not a good student of Russian history, unfortunately. I mean, I, I know the basics and the basic, basic progression of events, but I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not very well versed, versed in some very uh, some pretty important aspects of Russian history to be an authority on these things. What I can give you is anecdotal information based on my constant interaction with that country and people who live there. Because, again, I, I spend on average about two, two months a year over there for, on business. I go there several times a year for business, and you know, lots of my friends are over there, and uh, I'm in constant contact with uh, at least a, in a small slice of the Russian society. So I I will speak to what I know, and you take away from that whatever you want to or or can. Um, I will start by saying that I don't think that there's a great deal of receptivity in in the Russian society today towards the ideas of libertarianism. Okay, Russia is going through interesting times politically. Uh, you may have heard that uh, they had parliamentary elections last December. I think it was early December, like the first days of December. And the population suspected the ruling party of overwhelming and pervasive fraud, election fraud, Right, people took to the streets in some places. Moscow, predominantly, Saint Petersburg, some, mostly Moscow, and some some provincial smaller towns as well. Mostly Moscow, though, um, and it was hundreds of thousands of people at a certain point. And uh, Mr. Putin was setting himself up to uh, take the presidency back after a four-year hiatus. hiatus uh, Hiatus? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm maybe mis mispronouncing the word. And uh, that he took, um, you know, taken a position of prime minister, and, and you know, technically he wasn't running the country, but everybody knew who was running things really. Like Mr. Medvedev was just a, just a figurehead, and everybody, you know, the population is oh, Putin is coming back, and some took it with a resignation, others with joy, but there was some some subset of the population who said, shit, this is not good. This is not, you know. What is this guy doing? What, what? And by the way, in the interim, they've changed the constitution, so now the presidential term is six years in, in, instead of four. And, and in Russia, the parliament, um, the Duma, can change the constitution. You don't have to have, like, there's no federalism there. You don't have to have, like, consent of state legislatures because there are effectively no state legislatures because there are no states. Russia is a unitary state. It's not a federation in any sense of the word, even though it's called the Russian Federation. The official name of the country is the Russian Federation. That's what it says in my passport. But it's no federation. never was. It's a unitary state, um, so they're really administrative districts or provinces. They're, they're, they're really, in, in no sense of the word, there are any any like states. In the sense that the United, you know, the states comprising the U.S. are states. I, even here, it's like it's mostly on paper and it's gone. It's been gone for like 150 years. Uh, but even less of even less of that you got in Russia. And anyway, um, so they changed the constitution. The, the parliament unilaterally changed the constitution, giving the president a six-year term. So Putin now is in a position to serve again two times, because the constitution, say, the constitution doesn't say maximum of, uh, one person can serve is two terms. They say the maximum they can serve consecu consecutively is two terms. So they can take a break and then come back and serve another two terms. Right? 
-hmm. And who knows, you know, the next 12 years, there's plenty of opportunity to change the Constitution to take away that restriction. So Putin already, you know, he was designated by Mr. Yeltsin at the time of Mr. Yeltsin's resignation. He was designated as a successor and a relatively, in, not relatively, an absolutely an unknown individual who was the, the, the head of the KGB at the time. Several months after the announcement by Yeltsin that he has picked a successor, think about this though, a president in a nominally democratic state said, I've picked a successor for you, my people. And they vote for the guy, like, several months later, they vote for him. Overwhelmingly, the population gave him, like, 70-plus percent. Again, we don't know, you know, how many people even voted and, you know, what the turnout was and what the real votes were. But bottom line is people actually have voted for him, and, and people got enthusiastic about him. And that's one of the things I'm going to talk about. Um, um, they just, oh, you know, the, the czar gave us a successor. Well, I guess we must uh, obey him now, follow him now. And a lot of people are fine with that. So anyway, Putin uh, has been in power effectively since late you know, 1999, early 2000, uh, where he was like interim head of government. And then there was an election. He was officially elected president of Russia, and then he served two terms. And, and then Medvedev was installed as a, as a figurehead president, but, but Putin, you know, being uh, prime minister, really ran things. And now he's back. He won handily, won his election in March 2012. So he's got six years starting March 2012. And then, who knows, you know, chances are he, he will run, run, and win again. And so then serve another six years. So you got, uh, what is it, 24 years. <laughs> Effectively, 24 years, one guy running, running a country like Russia. Uh, it's pretty fascinating stuff. So here's the thing. A lot of Russians, I think a majority, a majority, maybe even a significant majority of, of Russians are okay with that. They are okay with that. The major difference that I see between the U.S. and Russia today, I can't, you know, it doesn't make any sense to talk about the Soviet Union because there was no politics in the Soviet Union. There was a dictatorship by the party and the ruling clique at the head of the party. Uh, but nominally, at least nominally, you know, you got some kind of democratic setup. And I'm no big fan of democracy. I hate democracy. I think democracy sucks. I think the state sucks. So, uh, you know, there you have it. But, uh, so it's not like I'm, you know, I'm in favor of democracy. I would be happy if Russia was more democratic. I, I, I probably wouldn't. Um, but the thing is, uh, in a nominally democratic country, people's outlook uh, and attitude towards the government is enormously paternalistic enormously paternalistic <sighs> one characteristic difference between here and over there the role of government in society the degree to which the government should have authority to interfere and regulate the lives of the people is actually a legitimate topic of political discussion in the United States I mean people disagree and there are different extremes and you know, your, your, your lefties will say that, it, it, he, over here in the United States, I mean, lefties will say, oh, government should be able to regulate this, that, and the other thing, and somebody more conservative, quote-unquote, will say, no, the government's role is described in the Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, blah, 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 you know, limited, enumerated powers, all that, but it's a legitimate topic of debate. In Russia, it's, it does not exist as a topic of debate. It's not a factor in political discourse. It does not exist in the political discourse in Russia, the role of government, the constraints or the limits to the role of government. I mean, people do not talk about it. People do not think in those terms. The existence and scope of state power is never, I repeat, never, never called into question. Neither one of those two things. Neither its existence nor its scope and limits think about it for a second again you know look at the political discourse in the United States people are actually think you know when I say people I you know obviously I mean some people not everybody but it's it's okay it's legitimate it's normal to be concerned with questions of well how much power should government have I know it's it's a relatively small minority of people that even thinks in those terms 
and it's an you know a, a much smaller minority among those that believes that the state is pretty much a legitimate or 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 the states in most of the states functions today are legitimate um, but it's a legitimate topic of debate not so in Russia so back to the political upheaval or not upheaval you know political passions that are you know being played out in Russia now so there's what we will term for the purposes of this video, opposition. There's popular opposition, there's political opposition, entrenched politicians like career politicians who are uh, batting against Putin's team now. And What are they fighting for exactly? And what are they fighting against, right? Well, the main beef is like, their main beef is voter fraud. Intimidation, political pressure, voting fraud and their main program is fair elections this is the stand this is how high they set the bar the word freedom like personal freedom and freedom from government in principle it does not come up okay it does not come up the absolute ceiling the absolute highest bar set for the people who are the most ardent uh, uh, opponents of the regime that is in Kremlin today their bar is set at we need fair elections the votes need to come in and they need to be counted and there needs to be no fraud and we need to have this you know the, the sovereignty flow from a mass of voters into whoever wins the actual majority of votes that's it. That's their program. There's no philosophical discussion of where the sovereignty comes from, why democracy is legitimate, why why have democracy, why you know how is majority preferable to a single person rule. There's no philosophical discussion whatsoever of these things. And again, you know, I understand that libertarians, even people like constitutional conservatives and like minarchists are in minority in the United States society today but they are there they're visible people understand that they exist lots of people don't don't agree with them let alone the anarchists right most people don't agree with anarchists uh, but it's a legitimate topic of debate what completely amazes me is even with fairly intelligent people I work with fairly, fairly intelligent people but even with most of them when I started talk about well, okay, so you you're gonna get those fair elections, um, and that is gonna be like this is what you want. This is the perfect program. This is this is what this is the situation that you would be happy with, as long as you can vote for them every four years or six years or whatever, and vote them out theoretically. You're gonna be happy. That's it. That's that's like legitimate. Let you're philosophically happy with that. And people are like, what? What do you mean? Don't you know that we're supposed to have fairly, you know, the way things are supposed to be is you're supposed to fairly. Look at the world. Look at the, the world, the West. They have democratic societies, and we need to, to have that. And, like, that's not, you know, anything beyond that is not, you know, not debatable. It's not even discussed. People literally do not understand what you're talking about when you bring up the legitimacy of government, you bring legitimacy of government into question. They can't follow you there. They don't have the equipment, the information, the habit of thought, the the background to even begin to discuss these things. They literally fly over their heads, these ideas. That's that's my, my assessment. You know, obviously there are some libertarians in Russia. Uh, one of my best friends actually introduced me to libertarianism. He, he lives in Russia, works there, lives there, um, but he's alone, you know, and it, he knows it very well. He's like, there's no, there is no community of like-minded individuals. There is a libertarian party, which according to him is a complete joke. They're not serious people. They're basically kids. Uh, and but as far as like the general, more general population, and especially the political opposition, there's nothing. There's no receptivity, no ground in which to sow the seeds 
of libertarian thought, almost, very little market for the ideas of personal liberty, libertarian philosophy, anarchy, anything like that. Anything like that. Um, what might be the reasons for that kind of state of affairs? Again, I'm not a very good scholar of these issues. I'm not a very good scholar of Russia. Um, even though, again, it's sort of my home country, but who cares? Um, I don't know. I don't know. Well, one thing, like, if, if you want to examine the reasons why there's such a difference between here and over there, well, you know, <laughs> the obvious thing is, you know, how, how the U.S. came to be, certain traditions that grew out of both the unique circumstances of the colonial life here and, you know, the remoteness of the, of the central government and a lot of, you know, the, the absence of technology for communication and transportation between the uh, metropoly and the colonies and, uh, you know, the English tradition of common law, some kind of self-government, which in a lot of cases took very ugly shape, like the theocracy of Massachusetts, what they did to people over, over there is just, it's just brutal and amazing and very, very bad. And sometimes, actually, the king uh, exercising his central authority was doing that. <laughs> it, it, you know, by, by doing that, he was effectively relie uh, relieving people of tyranny of the Massachusetts self-government. You know, self but anyway, um, so there's a tradition there. And the fact of the revolution and how it happened and the declaration and what, all those other things, yeah, obviously, you know, uh, those ideas were very central to the, the central to the very founding of the country. Nothing like that ever happened in, in Russia. Russia was always a monarchy, uh, or always, I don't know, you know, what do you count at the beginning of Russia? I don't know, I'm not even sure. Um, but nothing like that ever existed in Russian history. It was all, it was pretty much always a monarchy with dynasties succeeding one another, you know, f sometimes brutally fighting and czars doing all sorts of terrible things or stupid things or, you know, there was this forced from top down m modernization of, uh, attempt uh, by Peter the Great in uh, the early 18th century and then there was a Catherine the Great. Um, where would these things, where would these ideas even come from and, and be propagated among the population of Russia? I'm not even sure that there was ever an occasion for that in the history of that country. It was, it's actually a very, very sad place. Up until 1861, which, you know, incidentally, uh, was the year that uh, the so-called Civil War started in the United States. That year, the Tsar uh, um, ended, uh, ended slavery, ended serfdom in the Russian Empire. Up until that time, let's say 90% of the population were effectively slaves. Okay, so if you have a country that, you know, some mere 150 years ago, 90% of the population were slaves and had been slaves for dozens and dozens of generations. I don't know, it's not, it doesn't sound like a fertile ground for the ideas of liberty to me. Um, Um, also, the, the Russian psyche, I think, is different from the American and the British psyche. Uh, not the British of today, but the British of 17th, 18th century. Because um, you know, remember, there are a lot of sympathizers to the colonists uh, on the British Isles, uh, back in London and in, in the Kingdom in general. Um, there's a difference there. All of these things that I'm saying are generalizations, obviously, but you know they, they work to a degree. Again, paternalistic view of the state, incantational view of the state. Uh, the state is capable of anything. The state is supposed to be doing everything. It's supposed to be taking care of everything. The czar is like the father. Literally, that's that's how it used to be said. The czar is like a father, and the people are like his children, and he is taking care of the, his his people as a father would of his children. Well, you know, the Tsar is gone, but the view is there. It's changing slowly, and it's changing mostly in people who A, are making their own living, and B, travel a lot and are exposed to the rest of the world a lot. And I'm not, again, I'm not saying the rest of the world is perfect or close to perfect, but it's different enough to induce 
thought, I guess, in some people. But even those people still, you know, they sort of revert to this ingrained paternalism. They never question the state itself. They may question the individuals in power at the moment. They may question specific acts of the state, but don't. they never question the idea of the state itself. Never. It's amazing. I never hear any libertarian thought, any libertarian idea or statement from pretty much anybody in Russia with very very few exceptions of some really smart people but I could probably name like three that I know of course there are more but I only know three um, so yeah again the highest bar that people set is fair elections we need we want to be able to elect and people and kick the bums out next election cycle we want our votes to be counted. That's it. That's the political ideal for people. So democracy is taking, taken for granted, and that, uh, but that's that, that's not everybody. Not everybody thinks like that. Uh, most people will tend to to uh, sort of knee jerk into instinctively justify anything the state does. Anything the state does, there will be people whose first instinct will be to justify, and actually. Uh, passionately justify whatever the state is doing and they also personalize things a lot like Russia is Putin not Russia is Putin but you know they will want to per personally defend what Putin is doing uh, they will not th there's this tendency to not separate the person in power and the country we know you know if, if we're careful in our language if, if we understand uh, our own thinking. We under, we we realize how how dangerous it is to say the word we, you know, for example, in discussing anything political, like oh we tax the rich. No, we don't. <laughs> it's those people. This group of people call themselves the U.S. government. They tax the rich. We don't. Like oh we went to war uh, in Iraq. We didn't. I didn't. You didn't. Who went to war? And like okay, so certain people made the decision to go to war. Others were sent to fight the war. So when we say we, who who do we mean? It's like you know like people. People accuse Ron Paul of uh, saying that we, the people of the United States, or this is the U.S. society, the American society, has brought the terrorist acts of 9-11 and other terrorist acts on ourselves. Well, no, we didn't. It's the U.S. government that brought it on us. Okay? So we, you know, the, the blanket words like we are different, are, are dangerous. Russians are oblivious. Most of them are oblivious to, to these distinctions. And they will tend to blend the person of, say, the president and the country, whatever that means, and the state, the government, and themselves, and the flag, and all that into one big bl blob. Uh, uh, and they will slap a sticker, you know, label on it, you know, slap a label onto it that says Russia. And they will feel the need to be all patriotic. And if you say anything critical, you know, they will react pretty emotionally but you know and most people you know a lot of people do that here but there's more of a tendency to identify the country with the government and the government with the, the person of the leader and therefore the country with the person of the leader and to have your first instinct be to justify whatever it is that the, you know the the, 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 you know, the last thing the most recent thing that the leader has done there's no, you know, a, a lot of people uh, exhibit a painful lack of the ability to, you know, analyze things critically from some kind of principled viewpoint. Okay, what, <laughs> like their 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 vantage point moves with the actor. They can never stand in one place and look at the actor and analyze those actors' actions, deeds from some kind of, you know unmoving standpoint of some kind of principle okay say you know like stealing is bad let's look at what this guy did. oh he appears to have stolen stuff hmm that's not really good no they move with the act well yeah Putin uh, did X well he's Putin so he must have had a good reason <laughs> so therefore uh, you're an idiot <laughs> if you if they're arguing with me again I'm generalizing but some of these generalizations are you know they, they I think they reflect some kind of reality about the Russian people so I haven't given you a good explanation for, for why this might be the case. I know, and at most, I've probably shared a couple of anecdotes with you, but there you have it. That's, that's all I got for tonight.
let me know if you have any questions or thoughts or ideas. Uh, I'll appreciate hearing from you.